Okay, so let's start. Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, talk by our guest professor, uh, Ono Mutlu. Uh, we are very happy to have Ono here for this, or actually for last week, and this week uh, he's giving a course here in the framework of our PhD, School of our PhD education. Uh, and today he will give a more general overview talk about the topic of in-memory computation. Uh, at this point, I would like to hand over to uh, Professor Shafiq, uh, who knows Onur better than I do. So I would uh, ask Shafiq to introduce him a bit. Okay, let's see that how, how much better do I know. So I hope that everyone can hear me. So my name is Shafiq. I'm uh, Professor of Computer Architecture at the Technik Informatik. Um, so we have a pleasure to um, host uh, Onur for this guest lecture, and now he's going to give also this um, kind of seminar on in memory computing, uh, which is a uh, very important and, and emerging area in computer architecture. He's a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich. Um, he's also um, a faculty member at CMU, um, where he was previously also uh, for several years as assistant professor, I guess. Um, he did his PhD from UT Austin with Yelpet. So maybe many of you already know he's one of the godfathers of computer architecture. He did all this branch prediction, and uh, out of order execution. So most of the PCs that you guys are using basically are based on this technology. Um, Onur is um, having his research interest in computer architecture, systems, uh, hardware security, and bioinformatics. And he's uh, actually a world renowned specialist on memory systems. Um, he has also worked um, at Microsoft Research and also in the products and the research groups of um, Intel, um, AMD, VMware, and Google. Uh, several of his technologies are already in, in the products. Um, he has received um, the IEEE Computer Society Young Computer Architect Award. He has received the Intel Early Career Award, NSF's Career Award, uh, CMU's Lad Research Award, and several Best Papers and Topics Awards. Um, and he is also an ACM and IEEE Fellow. So please okay. welcome Unur. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Shafiq. And thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, let me see if this is recording. That's good. I see. I hear an echo here, but um, that's fine. Yeah, this is better, I think, with the echo. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some exciting work we're doing on memory systems uh, with a focus on enabling data processing somewhere outside the processor and accelerators. And in-memory is one of the examples of it, but th this talk is going to be broader than just in-memory, in my opinion. Uh, so let's start. Basically, we're going to talk a lot about uh, this system over here, which is called the main memory. And main memory, you have this main memory everywhere in computers. It's a critical component of all systems that we design today, all computing systems that we design today. And uh, it must scale in many dimensions if you want to get higher performance and higher efficiency, especially in terms of capacity, in terms of technology, in terms of efficiency, in terms of cost and algorithms we use to manage it, if you want to maintain the performance growth and the technology scaling benefits. And this main memory exists uh, in processors, it exists in FPGAs, it exists in GPUs, and in systems like this, we actually attach many, many other accelerators to it. Some of you may be working on machine learning accelerators, for example, or speech accelerators, and main memory exists uh, essentially as a bottleneck in all of those accelerators. A heterogeneous array of processing elements connect to main memory. And we will talk about how it's a bottleneck and how to solve that bottleneck. This is another picture. I used this picture. I drew this picture like 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago with XFIG. And I still like this picture. It's similar. It depicts uh, what a system today looks like, kind of. And uh, I'll make a, uh, only a couple of points here. If you look at a node that we designed today, we call it a computing system. But most of it is really dedicated to storing and moving data. There are caches, interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, memory controllers, interconnects, memory, interconnects storage, they're all dedicated to storing and moving data. They're not doing computation. Computation is restricted to these cores. And even if you look at a core inside or an accelerator inside, most of it is really memory. It's the L1 cache, registers, interconnects. Computation units are a very small part of the system that we designed today. If you actually do the studies, more than 80 to 90% of a single node is dedicated to just memory and storage. So basically, we're going to get back to this picture. Most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data. And this is because of the way we design the systems today. 
Let me tell you in one slide the state of the main memory system as I see them today. Basically, there are some recent technology, architecture, and application trends that lead to some new requirements from the memory system and that exacerbate old requirements. And we've always demanded a lot from the system, and we're going to demand a lot more going into the future. So this is going to be, become a bigger bottleneck. And I will show you, hopefully, that DRAM, dynamic random access memory, and the memory controllers, as we design them today, are unlikely to satisfy all of the requirements that we have. And they're already falling short of this. And also, there are some trends that are really interesting. There are some emerging memory technologies, many of which are non-volatile, uh, like phase change memory. Intel's 3D X point is one example of that, that enable new opportunities, like merging of storage and memory. So given these trends, I believe we need to rethink the main memory system and the systems that we're designing around it to fix the issues we're having with DRAM and to enable emerging memory technologies while satisfying all the requirements. Now, in this talk, we're going to focus a lot on this part. I'm not going to talk a lot about emerging memory technologies, but we're going to talk about uh, in-memory computation, which is also an emerging memory technology, in my opinion, which could be applicable to something like phase change memory or DRAM. But we'll talk about that when we get to it. OK, let's go into a little bit more detail in terms of what these trends are. These are the major trends that are affecting main memory, again, in my opinion. But I think this is uh, commonly known today. Essentially, uh, we want more performance. We want more capacity out of the memory more bandwidth, more quality of service, more predictability, and lower latency. So this part is about performance. So why is this the case? Uh, I would say there are multiple reasons. One is we know how to do computation really well. We know how to design the computing elements, uh, processors, and accelerators really well. And we are able to put many of them in a single uh, die. Applications are becoming increasingly data intensive. As a result, they're bottlenecked by how fast we can process the data, how much data we can store. And you can pick your favorite applications. It's going to be very likely data intensive. And we, we want to consolidate more and more. Basically, we want to put more applications, more workloads on the same chip, on the same node, because we want to improve the efficiency. That's true in cloud computing, in GPUs, in heterogeneous systems. I want to be able to execute many things on this at the same time, for example. OK, so this is clearly driving the requirements of capacity, bandwidth, quality of service, predictability, because there are many applications sharing the system, and also latency up. So this is one example. Uh, this is from a paper that was published in ISCA in 2009 by HP Labs and University of Michigan that essentially showed that core count is doubling approximately every two years, but DRAM capacity is not doubling as fast, which means that there is a memory capacity gap, which is not good for the software that's uh, written on top of these uh, systems because memory capacity per core or per thread is dropping by 30% every two years, according to their projections. This is not good because software has always relied on having more memory capacity per thread or per core. So this is, you can argue, you, can, if you should of course always question a graph like this. Is it still continuing? It may be continuing. Actually, in GPUs, this trend is very heavily felt today. There is a huge memory capacity gap in GPUs. We're able to put a lot of computation. In CPUs, actually, the trend is still going on. Maybe not as fast, but you should always think about why is the trend not going on if it's not going on. The reason is. We, we are able to put many cores, but if they're bottlenecked by memory, it doesn't make sense to increase the core count also. Right? That's one of the reasons, actually. So this is memory capacity. If you look at memory bandwidth per core, the trends are much worse. Memory bandwidth is increasing by 10%, excluding 3D stacking uh, per year. But we can put many, many cores on a chip. Essentially, the takeaway is we're able to put a lot of cores and accelerators on a chip, but we're not able to supply enough data storage or capacity and bandwidth them. We're essentially starving these cores even though we need the data inside them. OK, let's have some fun with the DRAM trends in a little bit. So this is uh, a picture of the last 18 years until 2017 of the DRAM history. And I'm going to plot uh, the improvement in capacity, bandwidth, and latency that we've seen over 18 years in the, D, uh, in the mo commodity DRAM chips of the day, DDR chips. If you look at the most common chip of every year, we're going to have some capacity, and how we're going to see how much capacity has improved. Can anybody guess how much capacity has improved in 18 years? Any thoughts? Thousandfold is an optimistic answer. But I would like it to be thousandfold also. But it has improved actually 128x in the commonly used, most commonly used DRAM chip of its day. But it's actually, it could have been thousandfold if we didn't have issues <laughs> over here, as you can see. So we're happy. Yeah, but not as much as DDR still. This is DDR, actually. DDR is uh, really designed for capacity. HPM, you, you keep stacking, but it's not going to be as much as DDR currently. So the HPM is not going to help this as much. 
Although in, at some point we're going to have my, much higher capacity. But you can see that the DRAM chips are designed for high capacity. Uh, and this is actually going to be the best metric that I'm going to show. Uh, they're designed for higher capacity, but we're having difficulties even right now. We're, we're not able to improve the capacity as much because of lower level circuit issues. Okay, bandwidth I'll give you quickly. It's about 20x in the most common. This doesn't include the 3D stacking like HPM. HPM actually improves the bandwidth even more. That's where it's really beneficial actually. Uh, but in the common chips, we have 20x. Uh, so DRAM chips are not designed for bandwidth per se, but the, the bandwidth is an important consideration. Uh, what about latency? How much do you think latency has improved over the last 18 years until 2017? Not much. So if you're 3x, I heard. It's like not at all. Yeah, you're close to not at all, basically. It's only 30%. And this is, I mean, there are multiple reasons for it, but this is really DRAM chips are not designed for low latency. And there is a fundamental trade-off between latency and capacity. And DRAM manufacturers usually make that trade-off for improving capacity and not latency in general. And I'm not going to talk about the latency as much. There are fundamental ways of reducing latency uh, in systems today, but uh, that's for a different lecture. Essentially, these are the trends. And uh, DRAM is actually critical for performance many applications. So if you look at some of these applications, they're limited by a complicated set of capacity bandwidth uh, and latency characteristics. And these are the applications we know. We're also working on bioinformatics applications that are more future looking. And they generate, uh, in genomics, for example, you can generate a lot of data that you can process. But we're generating a lot of data, and these applications are bottlenecked by uh, memory performance. And on the smaller side, smaller scale, applications that you execute on your cell phone, they're also bottlenecked by memory. I'm going to sh show you some results related to this. OK, let's, uh, that was performance. Let's switch to uh, energy. Memory, energy, and power is a key system design concern today. Uh, if you read this beautifully written paper by Charles Lafergie and others, uh, in about 2000s, early 2000s, they basically showed that in IBM's big iron systems, these are huge systems that IBM built at the time, more than 40% of the entire system energy is spent on the off-chip memory hierarchy. And at that time, off-chip memory hierarchy consists of off-chip caches, off-chip interconnect, off-chip DRAM, and off-chip storage. Now fast forward about 10 years, the same folks from IBM, they analyzed the power consumption of IBM Power 8, and they showed that more than 40% of the power of the system is spent only in DRAM. So DRAM remained off-chip, so it became the big bottleneck over there, and this is increasing. That's true for GPUs also. This paper talks about GPUs power, and we have a lot of results showing that DRAM is becoming a bigger power bottleneck. And one of the reasons is it consumes power even when it's not used. You need to periodically refresh DRAM. That's a fundamental limitation of the technology. And we will see that it's also a scaling limitation. So essentially, energy is becoming a bigger concern. A lot of the system energy, for example, this phone is right now spending its time refreshing DRAM. That's, what, that's what's draining my battery at this point. Nothing else, because I'm not doing anything else in this. OK, so let's take a look at an example. So I'm going to talk about this paper, hopefully, in a little bit. We recently analyzed uh, four key workloads uh, that are uh, executed on Google devices, Android devices, for example. And we found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on moving data between the memory and the processor, and memory and the processor. So we're going to challenge this, uh, this and try to make it more efficient later on when we come to processing in memory. But keep this in mind. Is this the right way of designing systems? Should we be moving this much data between the processor and memory and wasting energy? OK, so that was energy. Let's talk about scaling. So on top of all of this, we have all these requirements that are becoming worse. But on top of all of this, DRAM technology is becoming very challenged in terms of scaling. What does scaling mean? Scaling means that you reduce the size of a DRAM cell, memory cell. And you, as a result, you get higher capacity, higher density, hopefully lower cost, and hopefully lower energy. Of course, lower energy is hard to maintain today in many cases. Even in processors, actually, we're beyond that point. But in memory, we hit the scaling wall even earlier. Basically, uh, ITRS, International Technology or Roadmap of Semiconductors, has been projecting that for a long time that a DRAM cell feature size will not easily scale below x nanometers. Yeah, capacitor is very hard to scale, as uh, you mentioned over here. So of course. Over years, this x goes down in their projections, but I don't want to change my slide based on their projections, so I'll keep x over here. But we're going to get back to that x later on. Clearly, as you reduce the size of the cell, size of x, uh, you get these benefits. But if these benefits go away, because you cannot reduce the size of x easily, as I will show uh, that we're having difficulties, then it's going to be very difficult to satisfy all of these requirements at the same time. 
So these are all interrelated in some way also that uh, hopefully will be clear later on. Essentially, if scaling is a problem, actually scaling has already become very difficult in DM because of various issues in leakage current reliability, refresh, uh, difficult to scale uh, significantly improve capacity and energy going forward. People are still improving it as we will see later on. Uh, as a result, emerging memory technologies are actually very promising and there is a huge bifurcation of, or proliferation of different technologies uh, that we're seeing today that was not present 10 years ago, for example. For example, we're seeing 3D stack DRAM that's good at something. Reduced latency DRAM that's going to increase over time, I think, at low cost. Uh, low power DRAM is one of the most dominant forms of DRAM in these devices and laptops, for example. Of course, it's good. And there are a bunch of different types of non-volatile memory. Uh, one of them already hit the market, like 3D point uh, in memory form. Uh, that's also good for some things. But unfortunately, there is no single memory technology that's good at every metric that we want. All memory technologies are a trade-off. And even though people assume that they would come up with the best technology that's good at every metric, those assumptions have turned out to be not true, uh, especially recently. But anyway, it's good to try to design a memory technology that's good at every single metric that we care about, but it's, it's turned out to be very elusive to do that. As a result, a big trend in computing system design today is to put multiple different types of memory. It could be DRAM, phase change memory. It could be different types of DRAM, for example. That's already happening in GPUs, for example. Uh, types of, different types of memory that's green or good at different uh, complementary uh, metrics and that, is, that are red at or are not good at complementary metrics and design the hardware and the software to manage the data allocation and movement across these different types of memories to achieve the greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. And this is a very good direction. This is happening. It's going to happen even more going into the future. Uh, but it's not easy. And I think this is going to be my first example of why we need intelligent memory controllers. If you actually want to control these multiple different types of memories, you really want more intelligence in your memory controllers. And more intelligence can come in many different forms. The controller needs to understand what data is in different types of memories. The controller needs to be programmable such that a software, can, uh, a software can actually manage which data should go where, and the controller needs to communicate with the software better. But we don't have these controllers. That they, they need to be designed. So I'm going to show you examples of why we need these intelligent controllers to build up the need for uh, processing in memory as we go through this lecture. And actually, industry is also writing up papers about this. This is one of my favorite papers uh, that is written by two companies that don't normally talk to each other, Samsung and Intel. They don't even talk to each other through lawyers, I think, as far as I know. Sometimes they do, once in a while. Uh, but they actually were nice enough to write a paper to, in the memory forum we organized. And they basically said, we're having a lot of challenges in memory scaling, uh, refresh, write latencies, variable retention time. I don't have time to talk about all of these, but refresh is a key problem that I'm going to briefly touch upon. And as a result, if we, if we can design some intelligent controllers, we can overcome some of these issues. Maybe you don't understand what I mean at this point yet, but we'll, we'll see some examples of this. So if the DRAM technology is not scaling well, maybe a controller, an intelligent controller gets rid of refresh somehow. I'll show you some examples. OK, so this is an outline of what I intend to cover. Basically, we've covered the major trends affecting main memory. Now I'm going to talk about the need for intelligent memory controllers. I'm going to motivate it from bottom up first and then top down next. And I think I'm going to say that we're, going to, we're squeezed in the middle today in system design. We don't have no choice but actually doing uh, processing inside the memory, moving, the, moving some intelligence inside the memory controller. And I'm going to talk about two directions in processing in memory that has not, have not been looked at as much in the past. And hopefully, if we have time, we'll talk about some adoption issues. And we're going to spend two minutes having fun at the end, concluding. Hopefully, the rest will be fun also. But I think the last two minutes are more fun. So hopefully, you look forward to that. OK, so we're going to start with psychology. Does anybody know who this is without looking at the side channels? I guess it doesn't matter. There's a huge side channel here. <laughs> OK, that's a, uh, this is a very famous American psychologist, Abraham Maslow. And he dedicated his life uh, to understanding why humans do the things they do. And he clearly wrote a lot of interesting works. But he's more famous for this pyramid, perhaps, which is used heavily in economics, politics, and uh, psychology also. Basically, this is his hierarchy of needs. Uh, he says that most important thing that you need to satisfy first is your safety needs or physiological needs. Essentially, we need to start with the reliability and security. I think this is true for computing systems also. Whenever you design a computing system, it's not reliable, it's not secure, then you have a problem. OK, we're going to deconstruct this later on. But I, I like using this example of a bridge. Does anybody know where this bridge is? Yeah, Lepingarty. Yeah, Lepingarty. Yeah, are you a civil engineer by any chance? 
Okay, you've been there. You've been on this bridge? <laughs> okay, new one, exactly, yes. So he has not been on this bridge because this is what happened to this bridge six months after it was built. <laughs> it basically collapsed. And it collapsed, I mean, this is actually a textbook example of how to build bridges. Uh, it's, uh, there is a reason for it, uh, like resonance is one of the reasons certainly, but uh, anyway, I'm not going to go into the detail, but this is a reliability problem essentially that causes some safety and security issue. You can think of this as kind of like a bit flip in computers, right? I'm going to use this as an example for showing the effect of a bit flip. So if you have a bit flip in your memory, essentially all bets are off. Your, 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 uh, your, your bridge is destroyed and you cannot build a secure uh, infrastructure on top of that. But I would recommend watching the videos of this if you're interested. So this is another example that I use. These are folks who are constructing Manhattan uh, after the uh, World War. And these folks are very happy right now. But if the bit flip happens in the infrastructure that they're on, all bets are off again, right? They will not be very happy soon. So I use these uh, pictures to motivate DRAM scaling issues. And I, I conclude with this one saying security is about preventing unforeseen consequences. And I really believe in this definition, even though it's a very general definition. Somehow we need to design systems to be secure, meaning that we need to somehow uh, be patchable such that we can prevent even consequences that we don't foresee at this point in time. Okay, uh, and I think it's very important today especially because we're building a lot of our infrastructure to be very intelligent. We're putting a lot of, uh, uh, for example, um, a lot of machine learning in our lives, self-driving cars or whatever that's self doing self-X. And if there are bit flips that are happening that are not secure, that, that's going to destroy the infrastructure, we're even more liable at this point. So we may actually destroy the systems that we built if, if we're not careful in terms of security. So why is this related to DRAM scaling? Essentially, we're having these bit flips in DRAM today. So uh, let's go into DRAM a little bit more. Uh, if you look at DRAM, it stores charge in this capacitor. Like any uh, storage device, it needs, uh, like any memory, it needs to have a storage device and it needs to have an access device. In DRAM, the storage device is the capacitor. The access device is the access transistor, the bit line, and the sense amplifier. And for any memory to work, you need to have a good storage device and a good access device, which means that in DRAM, this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing, and this access transistor must be large enough for low leakage and high retention time. And this was the value that was assigned to X uh, by uh, ITRS in 2009. They said reducing the feature size of this DRAM cell below 35 nanometers is challenging. They didn't say impossible. They said challenging. Now, does anybody know what's the feature size of a cutting-edge DRAM cell today? Yes? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but it's 1x, 1y. I'll tell you the uh, what? Upper end. Upper end. Exactly. It's about 17 nanometers today. So clearly it's lower than 35 nanometers. So DRAM manufacturers pushed this hard and they've gone into a much higher capacity, much higher density chip. But this has actually come at a cost. And the cost is reliability. This is one example study that we've done with Facebook. We actually analyzed all of the memory errors that Facebook has all uh, over the world. And this is a lot of memory, a lot of servers. They don't allow us to publish how many memory, how much memory, how many servers, because they think that'll affect their stock price. But they should probably be more concerned about privacy issues than other issues that they have right now. <laughs> but anyway, they don't allow us to publish the memory size. But if you do this study, if you look at uh, all of the data centers, and if you look at, uh, if you categorize the error rate based on the density of the DRAM chip that's employed in the servers, you get a curve that looks like this. Essentially, as the chip density that's employed in the server increases, the server failure rate increases, meaning that you get more errors uh, on chips that are denser. And the reason is that there's quadratic increase in capacity and the cells are closer to each other, so cells are becoming much less reliable in this case. Okay, this is just one example. If you really want to uh, see more, this paper has a lot more detail uh, on the errors. So we've been also doing a lot of studies to understand these errors in DRAM. We built this infrastructure. This is an FPGA board uh, with some ma uh, makeshift heating, circulating, initial infrastructure. And we wanted to understand these scaling issues in DRAM. What are the reliability issues that we're facing and how can we fix them? And this is the next infrastructure. This is the next infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's getting better, as you can see. Uh, I'm going to tell you what we've studied, and this is the next infrastructure. This is not the latest one, but this is the one that we published and open source this infrastructure, and there are people using this infrastructure. It actually has an IC++ API. So it's essentially a memory controller 
to which you can, at, uh, to which you can attach uh, memory chips, and you can actually program the memory controller to test the memory chips, to test different characteristics like reliability, latency, etc. And uh, feel free to use the infrastructure, and we'd be happy to help with that. And that's the paper that open sourced it. So one of the things that you can study uh, with, uh, by the way, these slides will be available. So uh, if, if you're trying to catch up with my slide uh, pr procession rate, it may not be very easy, because I, I, I'm known to have very high bandwidth uh, slides per minute, <laughs> or slides per second. <laughs> but I'll, uh, we'll, we'll make, it, make, make them available. And if you're interested, you can also email me. So one of the things that we've uh, studied uh, uh, with this infrastructure, and the reason why we built this infrastructure is to understand the retention rates in DRAM. How long does a DRAM cell retain data? Today, we refresh all DRAM every 64 milliseconds. At the time, we did the study, actually. Now, refresh is becoming a bigger problem in LPDDR chips. Refresh rate increased to every 32 milliseconds. In, in fact, at higher temperatures, it's increased to 16 milliseconds. It's going to go down over time because it's a big problem. As you scale the circuit, cells become more leaky. You need to refresh them more often. But we asked the question, do you have to do that? And we tested a lot of DRAM chips. And what we found out was the retention time of DRAM profile looks like this. Essentially, there are very small amount of cells that need to be refreshed very frequently because they're weak. But most of the cells in DRAM, an overwhelming majority actually, they don't need to be refreshed as often. You can uh, refresh them every 256 milliseconds, and that's fine. Meaning that if you somehow have an intelligent controller, actually you do need an intelligent controller to figure this out, that profiles the DRAM, uh, an intelligent controller can figure out which cells need to be refreshed at what rate and adjust the refresh rate accordingly uh, based on the cell's characteristics. Now, that's not that easy. That's why you need an intelligent controller because this refresh rate, retention time, is location independent. It's dependent on the values that are stored in the cell and the cells around it, somewhat similar to human memory, maybe. It's also dependent on time. There's quantum-like effects that are happening in DRAM. If you actually look at DRAM at this point, the cell may retain data for hundreds of seconds. But if you look at memory 100 seconds later, for example, uh, that cell may retain data or for only 8 milliseconds. This is called the variable retention time phenomenon. And it's actually, this is a very difficult phenomenon to handle. The reason is charge gets trapped in the access transistor once in a while, and that's a random process. And once that random process kicks in, the access transistor becomes extremely leaky, and charge gets drained from the access transistor very quickly. I call this a quantum-like effect because it's really happening randomly according to what, I, what we've seen so far. And it's very difficult to find out the retention time of a DRAM cell once this happens, if this happens. And it, it happens uh, at a very large time scale. So clearly, if you want to exploit this, you, have, you need to have an intelligent control that handles all of these. And we've done a lot of work in this area that I'm not going to talk about. But I will say that if you want to get rid of refresh, you can actually do it with some intelligent memory control. OK, so that's one other motivation. I'll give you one more motivation that's even more serious, I think. OK, maybe you don't want to get rid of refresh. You're happy with your battery being drained with a refresh every 16 milliseconds. That's fine. Uh, but while we were doing a lot of these studies, we also discovered something that should not happen. And the, uh, this is called the Rohammer problem. Basically, essentially, one can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips. So we tested DRAM memory chips, and we found out that you can actually disturb the cells that you're uh, actually accessing. Uh, around, the cells around it. This is called the Rohammer problem. I'm going to give you an example of it. Essentially, it's a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And people actually wrote uh, articles that look like this. I like this one particularly because it's in Wired, and it says, forget software. Now hackers are exploiting physics. And it's actually true, I think. Uh, so what's happening is very simple. It's actually very fundamental to memory. Uh, whenever you're reading one location, you're disturbing adjacent locations. And if the cells are too close to each other, that disturbance effect becomes even more powerful because the electrical isolation between the cells is not enough if they're too close to each other. So in DRAM, you have rows of cells, multiple rows. If you want to access a cell in this row, you activate that row. That's called opening that row. You apply high voltage to the word line. Now, if you want to access something else, you pre-charge the array. You act apply low voltage. This is called pre-charge. So you have an activate and a pre-charge, high voltage, low voltage. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, this is how you read a memory row. If you keep doing this repeatedly, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, before the cells get refreshed, if you do it enough times before the cells get refreshed, it turns out some bits that are vulnerable get flipped from 1 to 0, or 0 to 1, depending on the encoding. 
uh, in the adjacent rows, in physically adjacent rows. Now we call this the hammered row, we call these the victim rows, and we show that these exist in more than 80% of the DRAM chips that are out in the field at the time we uh, did this study. And this is happening because essentially it's a scaling problem because uh, cells are too close to each other. Whenever you're activating this row, you're slightly affecting the word line of this row, and you're activating that row slightly. And what's happening is, this is one of the error mechanisms, uh, if there are some vulnerable cells over here, they're leaking charge a little bit. And if you do this activation many times before the cells get refreshed, some vulnerable cells leak charge, enough charge that you will not be able to restore that charge because you missed the refresh. Right? You didn't refresh them before they leaked enough charge. So uh, we tested many chips, 129 modules actually, from three major manufacturers who shall remain nameless, but you can guess who they are, <laughs> ABC. There are only three major manufacturers in DRAM. And uh, more than 80% of the DRAM chips uh, were vulnerable. And why is this uh, why is a, a scaling problem? It's a scaling problem because this effect didn't exist in chips that were manufactured before 2010. Here, the read disturb effect did exist, but you couldn't do enough activations within a refresh interval to actually exercise and get errors. But in 2010 or so, uh, the cells became too close to each other and you could actually do enough activations in pretty much all of the chips uh, that we've tested uh, that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 to cause these errors. And you can see the error rate. It's not manufacturer specific. It's really industry-wide scaling problem. Basically, you can argue that people didn't predict it. Yes, maybe, but clearly all of the industry had the scaling issue. Okay, so what's interesting about this? This is actually interesting. This is a reliability problem, but it's actually much worse. What you can do is you can write a user-level program, like what we've done and released it at the, with the paper. That's very simple. What this program does is it basically selects address X and Y that map to the same bank. It basically uh, bypasses the caches and bypasses the row buffer in DRAM. And it does this. It basically ping-pongs accesses to X and Y many, many times. And if the chip is vulnerable, it'll discover the errors. And this is a user-level program that's actually causing errors in uh, rows that it doesn't have access to necessarily. OK. And we showed that in real uh, systems, you can actually cause a lot of errors. There's nothing special about Intel and AMD. All of the uh, processor manufacturers with good memory controllers, and all of them actually have good memory controllers, good enough memory controllers for this, you can cause errors if your chip is vulnerable, if your DRAM chip is vulnerable. So this is a real reliability and security issue. Uh, it happens in real workloads, but a very small fraction of real workloads. But it also, uh, what's more interesting is it's really more of a security issue. Why? Because someone can write a program that does this. It could actually take over your system. And when we actually wrote the paper, we said that memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system. And access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. I still believe this is really important, I think. Very fundamental. And we said that because Rowhammer violates this invariant, you can easily construct many, many different types of attacks. So you can actually easily hijack the system by writing a user-level program. And while we were working on it, the good folks at Google Project Zero published this blog post in 2015 where they showed that you could exploit this DRAM row hammer failure mechanism to gain kernel privileges. And this is beautiful security engineering. If you're really interested in hardware security, you should take a look at this blog post and the Black Hat presentation associated with it by Mark Seaborn and Thomas Dullian. I'm copying and pasting. This is a direct copy and paste from their blog post over here. They basically said they learned about the problem from our work. They tested a selection of the laptops, and they actually replicated the problem. And they built two working privilege escalation exploits that use this effect to hijack something. One of, the, one of them uh, take over, takes over the Google native client. It's not that interesting to me. It's still beautiful, interesting. But the second one is much more serious, I think. It basically uh, is a user-level attack uh, that induces bit flips uh, with Rowhammer to gain kernel privileges in x86-64 Linux. And I'm not going to go into the detail of how this is done. Uh, I think it's a very beautiful security engine, but I'll give you the basic idea, high-level idea. Basically, the process uh, that the Rowhammer process was able to induce bit flips in the page table entries that belong to that process and that points to the process zone page table. Now, if you actually flip the right bits in your own page table, you can gain write access to your own page table. And once you gain write access to your own page table, all bets are off. You basically took over the system, right? Because you can change all of your permissions in the system. 
And that's essentially what they did. Of course, it's not as easy to do. It's beautiful security engineering. And this is the bit flip that a lot of the security community was waiting for, actually. Security folks were aware of the importance of bit flips as early as the 2000s. There's a beautiful paper by Andrew Apple's group, I think in 2001, I should really verify that. I have bit flips in my memory, so I don't remember perfectly, uh, clearly. But there's this paper attacking a virtual machine using memory errors. I would recommend reading that too. What they did at that time was uh, they went physically to a machine, they put a heating source, and they observed a lot of memory errors, and they used those memory errors to take over the Java virtual machine at that time. So they showed that you could do that. But after that, there is not much security research in the area because this is very hard to do, right? You need physical access, heating source, and if you have that access, maybe you could do even worse things to the machine. Uh, but Rowhammer provides a programmatic way of inducing the, these bit flips. You basically write a user-level software program, you can induce a bit flip, and you can figure out what, where, which location actually is affected. So you can actually do very targeted attacks. As a result, other people started building attacks, and people started drawing pictures like this. This is the row hammer. I like this picture. Is it the end of memory? I actually like this insightful uh, explanation from a famous hacker on Twitter. He basically says it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. That's a very insightful description of what's happening at some time. OK, so later people started building attacks. This is work by T.U. Graz actually showing that uh, you could actually have, gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors, do this attack remotely through JavaScript. This is very interesting. This is another work by uh, Fry University in Amsterdam that shows that you could do these attacks on Androids. They actually have an app you can download probably to get compromised if you're interested. Uh, what this does is this basically shows that uh, you could do these attacks, launch these attacks deterministically. What they did was they actually wrote a program that profiles the memory of a phone that figures out which bits are vulnerable to Rowhammer. And once you know a bit is vulnerable to Rowhammer, it's going to be vulnerable forever, almost, most of the time. That's what our, our paper showed, actually. And they uh, also showed that the memory allocation patterns of the operating system is predictable. And they were able to fool the, memory uh, the, the, uh, the operating system to allocate a page to a location that they knew was vulnerable to Rowhammer, and then they hammered that page. And as a result, they were deterministically able to take over an Android system. And I like this work. It's very interesting. Uh, and you can try it out on your own. So once you have a bit flip, people are very creative. Uh, they can accelerate these attacks with the GPU because GPUs are very intensive. They can generate a lot of requests. So you can actually row hammer much, much faster. And this work shows that you could do a, a take over a system through the WebGL interface via, via the GPU. This work shows that you could actually do this attack through the remote direct memory access interface. You can access uh, the, the memory of some other server and hammer it over there, and then you can take over that server. And these folks did the same thing at the same time. Uh, yeah, now you can see interesting pictures. I guess hammer is always a part of it. <laughs> so maybe this is one solution to the problem, right? I don't recommend this as a solution, but if you don't fix these bit flip issues, this may, be, this may be the solution. Or if you don't fix these reliability and security issues, this may be the solution. So what's the solution? Uh, the solution in immediate chips is unfortunately very limited. As you can see, Apple's patch is written here. They basically says they acknowledge Rowhammer. They said they mitigated the issue by increasing the memory refresh rates. Essentially, this is something that we don't want to do. We want to get rid of refresh because it's a big scaling problem in DRAM. But they increase the refresh rates. And I think this is a reasonable solution for the chips that are in the field, because how else do you, would you protect those chips? Because you don't have an intelligent memory controller that you could reprogram and say, OK, memory control, I'm having these row hammer issues. Do something else if you detect this hammering. If you had an intelligent memory controller, you could patch the memory controller in the field, and you could fix the problem. That's one of the motivations. But actually, this is not a bad solution in the current state of the systems. We don't have an intelligent memory controller. And I like Apple, because they credited the work that we've done as well as Google has done. Uh, maybe shame on some other companies that, have, that do not credit academic work in general. <laughs> OK. OK, so what's our solution? I think our solution, actually, slightly more intelligent memory controller. Uh, basically, uh, we, we, uh, we propose this solution. And I think this is actually a minimal solution to the problem. It's probabilistic. Whenever you activate a row, uh, with very little probability, refresh the adjacent rows. That's the idea. You don't increase the refresh rate across the board of the ERM. That's a lot of refresh. You do a very targeted refresh. And whenever you finish activation of a row, whenever you're closing it, activate the adjacent rows. It turns out this gives you a very good reliability guarantee, assuming you pick your probability nicely. 
Of course, if you're paranoid, you can increase the probability, right? So you can always uh, program this, uh, as I said over here. So it turns out the uh, performance and energy overhead is not very high in this case, and this doesn't require a lot of hardware cost. And we show that it's effective. Now, there are multiple ways of implementing it. One way is actually putting this inside the DRAM chip. I wouldn't recommend it for the reasons that I'm going to describe. It's already done today in some DRAM chips, actually, in most DRAM chips, I should say. Not exactly in the way we envision, but in some way. Essentially, there's a lot of time, uh, slack in timing and refresh parameters in DRAM today. So you're accessing memory for, let's say, 15 nanoseconds, but five of those nanoseconds are really not necessary. And what these DRAM manufacturers do is they actually sneak in some refreshes during that time. It's unnecessary because uh, it's there for timing uh, some sort of protection, right? And we show that actually there's a lot of slack in DRAM chips, and it could be used to actually fix this row hammer problem. Of course, I don't think this is a good solution because we want to actually get rid of that slack as much as possible. If you want to reduce latency, you want to get rid of that slack as much as possible. Okay. So another, I think a better way of implementing this is in the memory controller, uh, and but this requires better coordination between the memory chip and DRAM. And it, it's unfortunate today that memory controller doesn't know the physical structure of DRAM. So the memory controller controls memory, but it doesn't know which rows are adjacent to each other in memory. It turns out most, uh, so, so basically, uh, if, you, if you activate row X, and then if you activate row X plus one, you're not guaranteed that X and X plus one are adjacent because there's internal address remapping that happens in DRAM. Without this, you cannot have a perfect solution like what we've described. I think this information needs to be made visible across the stack if you want to have more intelligent memory controllers and better data organization in memory in general. Okay, that said, I think industry is progressing in good ways. So this is actually one of the latest Intel chips. And in their memory controller, they have some reconfigurability that's exposed to the user. In the BIOS, what you can do is you can pick your row hammer solution. You can pick your hardware row hammer protection or 2x refresh. And if you pick hardware row hammer protection, you can basically choose the activation probability that you have uh, for row hammer protection, essentially. They basically do something similar to what I just described, probabilistic adjacent row activation, except I don't think they know the memory addresses really well, so they're banking on the fact that memory addresses are adjacent to each other uh, in the uh, That's not necessarily true. I don't know if this completely protects against row hammer unless you set the probabilities relatively high. But I think this is a good direction because this shows that there is some intelligence in the memory controller, slight intelligence in the memory controller. You can program it slightly, at the bias level at least, and you can pick your own solution. And I think going forward, these solutions are going to proliferate and become more important. Okay, so I think I've told enough about low hammer. I can talk more and more about low hammer clearly, but I'm not going to talk about that. But if you're really interested, uh, this is the paper that originally introduced the issue. This is another paper that we wrote, and this is more of a, a retrospective paper that we recently wrote that talks about the problem and a lot of the work that has ap appeared since 2014, including some future directions. Uh, although it doesn't include the latest Rambleed work that was uh, developed very recently, I guess. I guess papers are a checkpoint in the state of the art at the point they were written, so they don't include the future necessarily. We need to write patchable papers or more intelligent papers maybe that, <laughs> that are patchable in the field. Okay, so industry is writing papers about it too. This was actually published in 2014 uh, and this is concurrent with the Rohammer work and they said that basically it's difficult to uh, improve DRAM scaling. So they also argue for a similar solution basically. We should have more intelligent controllers to enhance uh, memory issues. And actually we know how to build these intelligent memory controllers. I'm throwing this picture at you, but this is our, pic, uh, our uh, flash-based memory controller. This is our flash translation layer. Uh, again, FPGA-based memory controller. And we did a lot of studies on flash reliability. And if you look at a flash controller today, it's quite intelligent. It really overcomes a lot of the scaling issues that flash has, a lot of reliability issues that it has with many, many different techniques. I'm not gonna go through all of these techniques. If you're really interested, you can read this survey paper that we've written on what is done in existing solid state drives to overcome error, errors. And you will see that the control is extremely intelligent in how to handle the errors. And I think people are putting even more intelligence there. Uh, uh, the issue is DRAM is not treated that way. DRAM has been treated as a perfect memory for a long time, so we didn't think it should be intelligent. But I think it's, the time has come. DRAM has scaled to so small dimensions that we are seeing a lot of these circuit level issues. Now we need to make it more intelligent. So that's my big takeaway. I think I took this time to actually motivate it from the bottom up. At the bottom, we're having these huge circuit and device level scaling issues, which are going to get more serious and bigger. So I, I don't believe there is any better way of fixing, that, uh, fixing them than having intelligent memory controllers. 
just like in Flash. Flash is a very good example of intelligent memory controllers. OK, now I motivated this bottom up. Let's also motivate this top down. And hopefully, we're going to be squeezed in the middle. To do, uh, that, that will force us to do something different in computing systems today. So top down is also very interesting, I think. Uh, in fact, top down may be even stronger than bottom up. Bottom up is very strong because you run into these security issues. But top down, maybe we cannot push performance and energy to limits if we actually don't do something different. So there are three key system trends today that we have in computing systems. One is data access is a huge bottleneck. Applications are becoming increasingly data hungry. Uh, and they're dominated by data movement, as we will see. As we will see. Energy consumption is a key limiter. I don't think there is anyone who would argue with this at this point. And data movement energy dominates compute. I'm going to touch upon all of these issues. And this is especially true for off-chip to on-chip movement. And clearly, there is a need, need for more memory performance as data set sizes grow in all of these applications. And in my opinion, the, future, uh, the question is this. Do we want a future that looks like this, like beautiful Austria, I guess? Or do we want a future that looks like this, maybe 1940s Pittsburgh? <laughs> I don't think you would like that, uh, essentially. But we want actually something uh, bigger. So uh, I, I will destroy what I said earlier. Uh, Maslow, when he actually developed the hierarchy of needs, he didn't say security and safety is the most important thing. He said there's a physiological need that's at the bottom, which means that energy. And energy is perhaps more, even more important than reliability and security. You could argue, of course, philosophically forever. But I'm going to assume that energy is very important. But it's not just energy. We want sustainability. I think these two go along well. But we also want very high performance so that we can solve the most complicated problems that we have and we don't even know that we have. Right? So we want all of these at the same time. We're greedy. Then the question is, what do we do? Clearly, there's a problem. Data access is the major performance and energy bottleneck in systems today. But the huge problem is our current design principles cause great energy waste. We're moving data all over the systems. And also, they cause great performance loss. I put this in parentheses because we actually try out very, very hard to overcome this performance loss. We design our systems. If you look at a node, there are a lot of caches. There are a lot of prefetchers. There's a lot of multi-threading. There is a lot that's invested. And the cores are actually very complex to overcome the memory latency, essentially. As a result, uh, as a result you actually spend a lot of your real estate on these mechanisms that try to overcome the performance loss. But if you keep adding these mechanisms, they actually Increase the energy waste, increase the complexity, and you get into a vicious cycle, basically. And the fundamental problem is that processing of data is performed far away from the data. We're really trying to tolerate that very hard, but we're not doing the right thing, in my opinion. So what is the right thing? But let's, before going to the right thing, let's take a look at uh, a computing system. This is a seminal paper by von Neumann and friends in 1946. If you haven't read it, I would recommend reading it. And this paper also defines that a, a computing system has three components, computation, communication, storage, and memory. If you look at a system today, we have heavily optimized this computing unit, but we've mostly ignored the rest of the units. Essentially, data is processed only inside the processor or in the accelerators. I use computing unit to refer to processor and the accelerators uh, at great system cost. This is heavily optimized and is considered the master. Everything else is considered the slaves, and they're dumb. They're largely unoptimized. They cannot do processing on their own. They have to send the data to the computing unit, and computing unit basically orchestrates the processing. It does the processing, and no one else does the processing. Yet we know that memory is a big bottleneck. This is actually from 1996. Uh, Dick Seitz was the chief architect of Alpha 2164, 264, which was the fastest processor of its time, faster than the Intel processors at the time. Uh, and basically, after designing one of the uh, flagship processors of Alpha, he wrote this one-page article in the microprocessor report saying that it's the memory stupid. That's the title of the article, which says that uh, they, uh, they designed the alpha processor to finish four instructions every cycle, but it's finishing one instruction every four cycles. Basically, it's operating at 1 16th of its peak bandwidth. Why? The processor is waiting for data to come back from memory. And this is the fastest processor of its time. OK, fast forward about 10 years. This is from my data from my own PhD thesis, where I developed techniques to tolerate memory latency. And we looked at about 147 workloads that Intel used to design its processors with at the time. And we showed something similar. Most of the time, the processor is waiting for data to come from memory. OK, you don't believe the excites. You don't believe me. Everybody believes Google, so I'm going to present data from Google after I show my paper over here. So this is data from Google. Uh, Google recently published this paper in 2015, uh, where they showed that, according to them, 
all of their data center workloads are bottlenecked by memory. Basically, most of the time, the processor, which is actually a very heavy weight processor, is waiting for memory. Only 10 to 20% of its time, it's finishing instructions. So basically, over the course of the 20 years that I said over here, nothing has changed. The processor is still waiting for memory to supply the data. And they have more analysis in the paper. If you're interested, this is a beautiful paper to read. So basically, we're designing systems to be processor-centric. And as a result, processors are waiting. Because we are processor-centric, the system is grossly imbalanced. Basically, we're violating a key principle in system design. If you read uh, books on system design, they, will, they, they always say you should have a balanced system. But our system designs begin with imbalanced assumptions to be, uh, because we're processor-centric. Processing is done, done in only one place. Everything else just stores and moves data. As a result, data moves a lot. And this is energy inefficient, clearly. This is low performance. And this leads to a lot of complexity. To overcome this, we make the systems even more complex and the processors more bloated. We add a lot of these mechanisms to tolerate data access, complex hierarchies, mechanisms. And this makes systems even more energy inefficient, low performance, because you could have done something else as opposed to wasting that real estate. Uh, and this makes the systems even more complex. And as a result, we actually have a complexity problem in the design of processors today. And as a result, we have this picture that I showed you earlier. Most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data, not doing computing, even though we call these systems computing systems. Right? OK, let's look at the energy perspective. That was a performance perspective. The energy perspective maybe arguably is even worse. This is a slide that I borrow from Bill Daly. Uh, it's already an old slide, and you could actually take issue with all of the numbers over here. Uh, but basically, uh, the fundamentals remain the same. Uh, he assigns costs, energy costs, to different operations on a chip or off a chip. A 64-bit double precision floating point operation, which is a complicated operation, is only 20 picojoules today. A DRAM write or read is 16 nanojoules. That's 800x difference. And I'll take the liberty of increasing to three orders of magnitude because three orders of magnitude sounds more interesting, right? Okay, I'm going to change that a little bit. But basically, we have a huge energy problem. Uh, if you actually want to do uh, an addition, floating point addition, and store the result back in memory, you do three memory accesses just for this 20 picojoule, very cheap operation. And if you don't have a lot of locality, if you're doing a lot of random access, many applications actually do a lot of random access today, you're really wasting all that energy to bring the data, whereas computation is extremely cheap. Now, it, uh, let's go back 70 years ago uh, when von Neumann architecture was being developed. Uh, at that time, actually, this was very expensive. Actually, if you, it's hard to do these studies, but this was two orders of magnitude more energy costly than memory access at that time. Over the course of 70 or 80 years, we've swung back three orders, of, five orders of magnitude to the other side. And the reason for this is Moore's law enabled us to scale the size of the transistor. And then our scaling enabled us to scale the size of the transistor really well. But the interconnects didn't scale so well. As a result, we have an interconnect bottleneck today. So you could argue that memory bottleneck is really an interconnect bottleneck. I don't want to get into that philosophical discussion because most of memory is really interconnect inside. It's really a communication and data movement bottleneck that we have because interconnects are very costly today. OK, if you don't believe that 1,000x, there are other works that show that it's more than 100x. And actually, I was at the DAC conference recently, and people were presenting data from their AI ML accelerators. They basically put a number in their accelerators. They said uh, a memory access costs 160x. Uh, compared to uh, a floating point multiply that we do in our accelerator. So it's basically somewhere between two to three orders of magnitude difference in terms of memory access and add operation in terms of energy. As, as a result, in real workloads, you have this real data that says more than 60% of the total system energy is spent on data moments because data is moving on these energy inefficient interconnects. Essentially, my point is we do not want to move data. We want to keep the data where it is, and we want to move the computation to it whenever it makes sense. So essentially, we need a paradigm shift to enable computation with minimal data movement. Compute where it makes sense. I'm not arguing you should always compute in, uh, in memory. You should really compute where it makes sense, where the data resides, uh, and orchestrate that computation. If it makes sense to compute in the SSD, do it there. Design mechanisms to do it there. If it makes sense to compute in memory, design mechanisms to enable that. If it makes sense to compute in the caches, design mechanisms to do that. If it makes sense while, to compute while the data is moving, design mechanisms to do that. But we have none of those options available to us today. We have only one choice, and that's the processor and accelerators. Right? So basically, we need a paradigm shift to enable those options. And the, the options are actually many. 
That's why this is a very fascinating research area also. Essentially, we want to make computing architectures more data-centric as opposed to processor-centric. Okay, so this is an example. We've been looking at in-memory processing, and I'm going to show you examples of this. I think in-memory processing is very interesting. Uh, you could think about doing the uh, computation in caches, SSDs. I think memory is harder because the interfaces that we have for memory have been very rigid over the course of many years. That's why we wanted to tackle it inside memory. And also memory is interesting because memory is a fast memory that can store a lot of data. Caches, you don't have that. That's why memory is very, very interesting, I think, today. Okay, basically, we want to enable things like this. Essentially, store a lot of data in memory. And we'd like to be able to query that, ask the memory question. Memory, can you do this function for me? And then if the memory says yes, it executes that function and returns the results. And then there is a communication between whatever is communicating with the memory. It could be another accelerator. It could be processor. It could be something else, an FPGA. And then the memory actually is intelligent such that it can provide these results, thus functions, provide different kinds of services. So there are many questions over here, of course. How do we design the compute-capable memory and the controllers? How do we design the processor chip and in-memory units? How do we design the software and hardware interface to enable that? In memory, we don't have the hardware interface. Today, memory interface is very primitive. You can read, write, refresh, and a couple of power down modes. Basically, simple commands. There is no intelligent function shipping that's happening to memory. On top of this, how do we design the system software and languages? Because you need to be able to write code and say that this should be executed in memory, potentially. Or someone designs compilers that are intelligent that takes your code and ships the code to memory. We don't have any of that today. And on top of that, maybe if you have computation capability over here, your algorithms need to change. And I actually believe that your algorithms need to change if you want to take advantage of memory. And I'll give you some examples uh, later on. And I believe also maybe there are some theoretical uh, explorations that need to be done because the theory of computing as we've developed it is really focused on processor-centric. There are assumptions that are heavily ingrained in theory of computation that we have that assumes that processor is the master. We don't explicitly put these assumptions, but the assumption is really there. The processing is done somewhere here. It doesn't take into account memory being intelligent. And I'd be happy to talk about that. Okay, so on top of this, essentially, basically, this is an across-the-stack problem. It really spans devices to do this, uh, to be intelligent, uh, and different layers to take into account the intelligence and algorithms uh, to be intelligent. I don't know how to make the electrons intelligent. That's not my expertise, but maybe someone will come up with that also, probably from the physics department. I think quantum computing is probably the closest that it gets to electrons being intelligent, but I don't know enough about that area. Okay, so uh, this is actually an old idea. Uh, I should really acknowledge this because there's been a lot of work in processing in memory. The, the earliest paper in the general purpose domain was by Harold Stone, which was published in IEEE Transactions on Computers in 1970. But he did the groundwork in 1960s. And it, it's basically called a logic in memory computer. And later in the 80s, 90s, uh, database community, for example, uh, looked at the non-1 machine. But it never took off. Uh, why? I believe that we were never squeezed in the middle. <laughs> Basically, today we're squeezed in the middle. We have a huge push from the technology. We're not able to scale memory easily. As a result, industry is finally open to new architectures. And they've actually been designing new architectures that look like this. Basically, you have a controller, logic layer, underneath memory layers over here. That's the hybrid memory cube. High bandwidth memory is very similar. We're going to talk about this. And even there are simple prototypes that can do processing inside the raw buffer. Very little type, very small processing, but it still exists, actually. <clears throat> if you went to industry 10 years ago, they wouldn't do something like this. But now they're doing it. OK, there's a huge pull from systems and applications. We already covered this. Basically, we are increasingly constrained by data movement and data access. So we need to, I think, re-examine the ideas. But I think we should really take a different approach. <clears throat> Sorry, I should probably. Maybe if you have a question, you can ask it at this point. OK, not a fast enough question, so we'll move on. <laughs> OK, basically, uh, I think we should really still take a different approach. In the past, people have proposed adding <coughs> heavyweight processing units inside a DRAM chip, inside a memory chip. I don't think that's going to work really well. Maybe simpler processing units inside a DRAM chip makes sense. But very heavyweight processing units inside a DRAM chip is going to be very difficult because these are completely different technologies, unless we come up with a completely different integration technology, which could also happen. I'm not going to overrule that, but I think it's going to be a longer term solution uh, to do that. That's why we've been looking at two different directions. One is surprisingly not been examined as much, minimally changing memory chips. What can you do to the memory chips minimally 
such that you can take advantage of what's already in there for computation. Surprisingly, this was not examined as much in the past, so I'm going to start with this. And I'm going to cheat. I'm not going to even talk about computation. I'm going to talk about data movement and computation. Basically, it turns out almost all memory technologies have great capability to perform bulk data movement and computation internally with small changes. You can exploit internal connectivity to move data. You can also add internal connectivity, which I'm not going to talk about. But you can also exploit analog computation capability that's present inside the memory chip. And there could be other things. I'm going to give you some examples. And before I do that, I'm going to start with data copy and initialization and motivate that. This is a primitive operation that's used in many, many workloads, operating systems. As you can see, we initialize data. If you want to start out a database, you initialize a lot of tables to begin with, and that takes a lot of time. And there are many, many examples of this. For security, you want to initialize also. And this is actually a very telling uh, example. It's from the same paper where Google showed that processors are waiting for uh, memory most of the time, they also show that just these two system calls, mem move and mem copy, is, are responsible for 5% of the entire execution cycles across all of their workloads in their data center. 5% is a big number if you look at average across many, many workloads. And these are just two system calls. OK, so how are we doing uh, the data moment today? Uh, if you want to copy this page to this other page in memory, today we go through the processor chip. Basically, you bring the source page byte by byte all the way into the cache. You bring the destination page byte by byte all the way into the cache. You do the copy, and you write back the destination page to memory. Now, this is high latency, high bandwidth utilization, because you're actually chur uh, churning a lot of data throughout the system. right? And you're actually utilizing a lot of bandwidth on the memory bus. Think about a four kilobyte memory page. And if you think about a one gigabyte page, probably you should probably not think, <laughs> uh, because it's, it's really bad. <laughs> Uh, you, it causes cache pollution in the hierarchy. You may not even have use. But you could eliminate that by setting up the di direct memory access engine today. You could actually set up the memory controller to do the direct memory access and do the copy through this path as opposed to this path over here, which saves some of the cache pollution, but which still has high latency and high bandwidth utilization. And it causes a lot of unwanted data moment. If you're initializing memory that you're not going to touch for a long time, for example, you're actually moving data into the chip without getting much benefit or any benefit from that moment. So if you do a 4 kilobyte page copy through the direct memory access engine, just this path, with some technology assumption, it takes about 1,000 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules. This is a lot. So wouldn't it be nice if we had the option, if we provided the system the option to do this? Basically, memory does the copy internally. It doesn't uh, uh, touch anywhere else in the system. This is low latency. I'm going to show you how to make it very low latency. Low bandwidth utilization, you don't move any data. You just need to send the command saying, copy this page, this, this page to this other page. No cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today also, uh, anyway. No unwanted data moment, essentially. I'm not suggesting that you should be always doing this, because sometimes the caching is very powerful here. You should keep doing this inside the cache, for example. But when it makes sense to do this, we don't have the option. We'd like to enable that option. And what does that option buy you? Today, it's about 1,000 nanoseconds for that 4 kilobyte page copy. If you do it in DRAM, it's 90 nanoseconds. That's more than an order of magnitude. And actually, you can optimize it to be 70 nanoseconds. And this 3.6 microjoules goes down to 0.04 microjoules, and you could optimize it to be even more efficient, almost two orders of magnitude. And the, it's really efficient one inside one memory chip. Exactly, yes. So this works inside one memory chip, but there are a lot of applications that do that. If you want to go across memory chips, I think you need other solutions like 3D stacking, for example. But there, it, across memory chips, is, things are harder. I absolutely agree. Uh, so uh, how do you do it inside the memory chip? So it, it turns out these mechanisms did not even exist inside the memory chip. I think we should start with inside the memory chip and solve the, those problems. And then maybe we'll develop solutions for across the memory chips as well. Uh, OK, so how do you do it inside the memory chip? If you look at DRAM, it consists of rows. And these are the sense amplifiers. Basically, it's very simple, almost no hardware cost. The first step is to activate the source row, which brings the data into the row buffer. Now the data is over there. And the next step is actually to activate the destination row. If you activate it, it implicitly deactivates the source row. It connects the sense amplifiers to the destination row. And the sense amplifiers drive the data that they strongly store into the destination row. And that's the idea. It's very Exactly. Exactly, yeah. So there are other benefits, reliability benefits. So things are actually good if you do it that way. Uh, and it's negligible hardware cost. Uh, it's almost doable in existing DRAM chips, actually, but we'll not go into that right now. Almost doable meaning that existing DRAM chips should be able to do this, but DRAM manufacturers do not allow you to do it. Uh, but OK, uh, 
of course, this is in one subarray. There are other parts of a DRAM chip. You can move data between different subarrays, between different banks. I'm not going to talk about that. This paper provides mechanisms for this. In the best case, where the source and destination are in the same subarray, you're copying data. You improve the latency by more than 10x. You improve the memory energy by more than 70x. I think you can optimize this even more. We didn't really completely optimize this. But of course, the benefits are heterogeneous, so you need to have actually intelligent mechanisms to be able to do that, which we're not going to go into. But these are some of the adoption issues that are really important going forward. How do you maximize the benefits of doing something like this? And actually, initialization is a special case of copy. I didn't talk about that, but uh, you copy a, a row to another row. If you initialize a row to all zeros, essentially you can copy it to many, many rows in memory, and you can initialize memory this way. OK, so this is, uh, this is the mentality that I would like to set. Essentially, we're designing all of these accelerators over here. They're sitting on the left side of the memory bus. Why don't we have an accelerator on the right side of the memory bus that's good at exploiting the capability of what we have over here? That's the idea. Essentially, we'd like to treat memory as a conventional accelerator with these minimal changes. And there are, of course, many, many issues that exist, like programming. But they also exist in GPUs. And GPUs took off, even though programming was difficult, because they offered, offered some value. I believe memory will off also offer value, even beyond what GPUs could offer. If it's a different kind of value, but it's uh, low latency access to, uh, high bandwidth access to this data. OK, I kind of cheated. <laughs> I said that we're going to talk about computation, but I gave you zeroing, initialization, and uh, copying. So how can we do more? Essentially, we can support other operations at low cost. I'm going to talk about that. But for that, I think you need to go into the analog computation capability. And the idea is very simple again. Making it work will take some effort, as with any kind of analog computing. You, we want to activate multiple rows. And if you activate multiple rows at the same time, this naturally performs computation in DRAM. I'm going to show you how this is done. And this leads to significant performance and energy improvements. And this paper describes this. I believe that new memory technologies like memristors, resistor RAM, page change memory, SDRAM RAM enable similar opportunities, maybe even better than DRAM, because they can operate on data with minimal movement, and they have this different structure. Uh, and you can actually mix the voltages, for example. So you can actually do computation uh, without moving the data that much. In DRAM, you have to fundamentally move the data, because whenever you're reading something, you're destroying the data. You have to move the data at least a little bit so that you can operate on it. But in these technologies, you don't necessarily have to move the data. And people are looking in this direction, doing matrix multiplication and analog array, uh, for example. I'm not going to go into that, but I, I think we need to investigate this more going forward. Exactly. Exactly, yeah, exactly. That's analog computation. But in DRAM, it turned out there is not a lot of work. Uh, and this work actually shows that you could do bitwise and and or. So assume an ideal circuit over here. These are three rows, A, B, C. These are three, just one bit line. Of course, the row is 8 kilobytes wide, for example. It's wide. So if you actually had the primitive to concurrently activate these three rows, which we call triple lower activation, this is what would happen. You would concur concurrently connect these cells to the bit line. And the result that you would get on the bit line is a majority circuit, which means that at least two, if at least two of these are charged, you get the charge state here. If at least two of these are discharged, you would get the discharge state. Why? Because of charge sharing. Essentially, based on the charge sharing principles, you would get a majority circuit. And the final state is this. Now, this is beautiful. You can do bitwise majority across a DRAM row. And in DRAM, you have many, many subarrays, let's say 1,000 subarrays. You could be operating, you could, you could be calculating the bitwise majority of an 8 kilobyte row, uh, two, two 8 kilobyte rows in 1,000 subarrays. That's the nature of parallelism inside a DRAM chip. Of course, you need to satisfy the power requirements of that chip, but nobody said that it's going to come at no cost. Right? So basically, this is nice. And it, if you actually read uh, Donald Knuth's fourth book, it talks about the majority, of circ majority circuit and its benefits. I think it's really beautiful. And recently, there's some work at EPFL that showed that you could do logic synthesis much more efficiently if you use these majority functions. Nice. There's another realization. If you set C to 1, you get the OR of A and B. If you set C to 0, you get the end of A and B by rewriting this Boolean equation. Now, by controlling what value you store in C, you can get the OR or end of these rows. That's bitwise end and OR in D. It's beautiful. But it's not complete. To be able to uh, have something functionally complete, you need a NOT. Right? And that's what we added. This work it comes a, a little bit more cost. If you look at a DRAM, row, a DRAM uh, subarray, 
uh, you actually have the complement of the value that you read on the other side of the sense amplifier. Sense amplifier actually is a cross-coupled inverter. One side gives you the value, one side is not connected to anywhere, really. Uh, basically, but you have the complement. So you already have the knot. What you need to do is really feed that back into the array so that you can capture the complement uh, value of a row that you've activated. And that's the idea. I'm not going to go into more detail, but this works. And this paper actually does a lot of circuit simulation to show uh, that it works. And the perform, I'm going to skip the slide. Uh, essentially, the performance and energy benefits that you get if you do bulk bitwise, not, and, or, uh, it's very high. You get about 60x energy reduction and more than 50x performance improvement compared to the current interfaces uh, through which you could do it. And you could, of course, compound these operations. You could do NAND, NOR, XOR, XNOR uh, by compounding those, uh, these operations. And this is the mean for some, whatever you average that means. OK, the next question is, of course, how do you use this? Uh, this gives you a substrate. And this is actually a completely general purpose substrate because you really have uh, a functionally complete system. You can build any application on top of this, really. Maybe not as efficiently, though. If your application is amenable, which means that if your application is written to exercise these bulk bitwise operations, you could get a lot of benefit out of this. And we uh, realized that when we actually wrote the paper, we looked at database indices that do bitmap-based indices. These are databases that work on huge bitmaps. And to be able to satisfy a query, you need to do a lot of ands, ors on the bitmaps. Uh, actually, some people uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Jignesh Patel's group, designed this database that's called Bitweaving Database that is designed for GPUs and bitwise parallelism. And the idea is actually to uh, do almost all of these database queries in a bitwise parallel manner. It turns out that's a very good fit for this kind of substrate. And Microsoft has designed this bit funnel uh, web search engine that's also based on similar principles. But there are many other applications that operate on bitwise operations, a lot of bits, essentially. And this is the bitmap index based database. You can imagine representing data this way and different properties of data with many, many bitmaps. And whenever you're doing a query, you choose the particular bitmap. And if the query is complex, you end that bitmap and or that bitmap with other bitmaps. And it actually port uh, uh, some queries to the substrate that I just described, you get significant performance improvements in the execution time of the query. Of course, it's all simulation, uh, but I believe there's uh, even more benefit that we didn't exploit uh, in the substrate. I believe you can do better because you, we're rewriting the applications over here. So it's five to six X performance improvement. If you, if you take a database that's already designed for bitwise operations, the bitweaving database, and if you port it to the substrate we have, you actually get even more performance improvement. And the beautiful thing over here is as you increase the size of your data set, which is going from left to right and going from left to right over here, the performance improvements increase because you can parallelize that across a DRAM module. And if you have multiple DRAM modules, you can parallelize your data across multiple DRAM modules, as long as you don't need to communicate between the DRAM modules. And this was where the idea was initially proposed, and this is actually the complete uh, idea if you're interested in reading that. OK. I, actually, we have another paper that talks about uh, a broader view, but I'm not, I don't have it over here. Essentially, we would like to have computing architectures with minimal data movement. And I will uh, finish this particular portion with this question. Does memory have to be dumb? I think this, these results show that memory can, uh, you can benefit a lot with minimal changes to memory. Now let me go into 3D stacked memory very quickly, and then we're going to conclude. So there's another opportunity, which is exploiting 3D stacked memory. And this opportunity is very interesting because these already exist. Uh, essentially, industry has devised uh, these logic plus memory arrays that are connect where the logic layer is connected to the memory layers with high bandwidth, low latency connections. Uh, and this is based on 3D integration capability. And other three, two 3D technologies are under development, the monolithic 3D technologies. Uh, I believe this is going to be very, very interesting going into the future. But these already exist. And this is based on a paper that we written in 2015. We show that there are many 3D stack technologies. And GPUs already use one of them. High bandwidth memory is a 3D stack technology, although GPUs use them in a different manner, in 2.5D manner. OK, so what are the opportunities in 3D stack DRAM? When we first started looking into this, we asked two big questions. One is, how can we change the system entirely to take advantage of this? What are the benefits that we get? Basically, if we push the boundaries, how much benefit are we going to get? OK, if we don't do that, if we do simple function off offloading, what are the benefits that we get? And also, what is the minimal thing that we do with these type of memories uh, with processing and memory support 
with minimal change to the systems I'm programming, what are the benefits that we get? I'm going to give you results, especially from here. I'm going to very briefly talk about this one, not go into detail uh, over here. But it's always, whenever you have a good tech, uh, new technology, it's always good to ask these two questions. What is the maximal benefit that we could get, assuming our imagination runs free? And what is the minimal benefit that we get if we actually we try to change the system minimally? Let's start with this one. And when we first started uh, with this one, essentially we were look looking for applications. If you want to look at maximal benefits, it's good to be application specific. And we focused on graph processing. I think graph processing is very interesting. There are graphs everywhere, clearly. Uh, and Facebook always corrects me in this slide saying that they have 2.33 billion users, not 1.4. So I had to add circa 2015 over here. Uh, essentially, and graph processing is used for bioinformatics also, machine learning. Many of these frameworks are actually based on graph processing. But this is a challenging problem. If you actually add more cores to your system, you don't get a lot of speed up. You actually waste a lot of energy. Why? Basically, most of graph processing kernels are, they do a lot of random memory accesses. So they don't benefit uh, from the cores. And also, they have little amount of computation. They don't benefit from the cores. They actually don't benefit uh, a lot by increasing the number of cores. So we designed the system. I'll give you a very brief overview of the system, not going into a lot of detail. The paper has a lot of detail, clearly. Uh, essentially, it's a full system design. We start with this 3D stack, memory plus logic chip. And each, if you look inside this logic layer, you see a bunch of these smaller uh, things that are called vaults. And these vaults essentially house the DRAM controllers that control the memory on top of them. We're going to add very simple in-order cores inside these so that we actually uh, don't waste a lot of energy also. But these in-order cores are going to be responsible for updating data uh, that's on top of their stack. And you have many, many cores over here. They can communicate with each other through some network. And if you want to scale the system up, you basically put, the, uh, put together an interconnected network of these chips. And you need to lay out your graph on top of this, on top of the chips, as well as on top of the vaults. And the key uh, idea over here is that you communicate uh, between the vaults through message passing. Whenever you want to update a graph node, you don't bring the data of that graph node into the core that needs it. You send a message to the, uh, to the vault that houses that node saying, do this operation on that data. Essentially, it's a message passing based system. It's very similar to very large scale distributed systems are programmed today. So we get rid of coherence, for example. We do remote function calls on the data. Of course, the programmer needs to program this accordingly. And we have some prefetching mechanisms that I'm not going to talk about because this, this is actually really important because you get a lot of bandwidth exposed to these cores, and the cores are not able to saturate the bandwidth. So we add a lot of prefetching mechanisms to exploit that bandwidth for higher performance. So what are the benefits that we get? I'll give you the performance energy results really quickly. These are the systems that we compared to at the time. Not a lot of bandwidth exposed to the cores. Tesseract looks different because it doesn't have the processor memory dichotomy. All of these are plagued by the processor memory dichotomy, as you can see. But in Tesseract, you, uh, all of the cores are exposed to 8 terabytes per second bandwidth. So we improve the bandwidth a lot, and latency also reduces. And what is the effect on this, on performance? Essentially, you get significant performance improvement, more than 13x performance improvement, average across five different graph processing algorithms that are used across industry and many, many other places. But I don't think this is the end, because we didn't really optimize the system a lot. I think you can do even better than 13x in this case. Uh, you can see that some of the benefits are coming from increasing the bandwidth and the programming model exploiting that, but we're exploiting about 2.9 terabytes per second out of the 8 terabytes per second. And energy reductions are also commensurate. It's 8x energy reduction in the system. And again, this is not the, uh, I think you can do even better than this. And if you're interested, you can take a look at this paper. Let me give you one more result with a simple up functional floating. You may say, say that, okay, this is very unrealistic. You change a lot in the system. And yeah, I agree. Maybe it's not easy to adopt. But there are other simple ways of taking advantage of it. And that's what we did with the work we did with Google. Over the course of one and a half years, we essentially analyzed some of the key workloads on these devices. Clearly, energy consumption is really important in these devices. And these workloads, counterparts exist in other uh, systems also. But uh, these workloads are very interesting, I think. Essentially, we found out that more than 60% of the system energy is spent on data movement across the memory hierarchy. And we wanted to understand, can we mitigate this by do putting some simple compute units inside the logic layer in main memory? Of course, a big challenge here is limited area and energy budget. I'm not going to talk about this as much. The paper covers a lot of this. It's really important. So the second key realization is that a significant fraction of the data moment comes from simple functions often. 
And we can implement lightweight logic to implement these simple functions in memory. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this very quickly. So how do you actually implement lightweight logic? You can have a small embedded low power core, or you can have small fixed function exercises. In my opinion, having a reconfigurable logic layer at the bottom of memory is really important because you can reconfigure it based on the function that you need. And it turns out you can improve performance and energy by about 2x. So you, that, that's what the result shows. Let me give you an example, and I'll pick the machine learning workload as an example. Uh, your phones do a lot of machine learning, for example. Your systems do a lot of machine learning. It turns out a significant fraction of the inference through the neural network is spent on data moment. And a significant fraction of that data moment comes from very simple functions. Packing, unpacking, and quantization. So what are these? Very quickly, it's a very simple function that reorders the elements of the matrices between the layers of the neural network so that you can operate on, that, on, on a layer efficiently. And it's a very simple data organization that requires simple arithmetic. That's one example. The second one is used on, in almost all neural networks that I know of. I, I believe I should say all in this case. Essentially, you start out with large data, but you don't want to operate on large data, but it's expensive. So you actually quantize that data to smaller uh, data and uh, simpler formats. And it turns out that quantization consumes a lot of energy because you're moving a lot of data in this case. But this is also a very simple data conversion operation. So we basically pick these functions intelligently and put them in the memory uh, controller. And as a result, you get significant, uh, in this case, energy improvement. You can see that there are similar functions that exist in the browser, like compression, decompression, which are more general than the browser, of course. Uh, similar functions exist in video playback and capture engines. And if you put these functions in a, a, a logic layer, you get significant energy reduction. Uh, and that's true for performance improvement also. You get about 2x performance improvement. Again, I gave you a brief overview, but if you're really interested, you can take a look at the paper uh, for more detail. So there are other works that are really interesting that I'm not going to cover over here. Uh, these slides will be available. You can take a look at that. Pointer chasing is something else you can accelerate. There are other things that you can accelerate. And we also uh, tackle this question. Let me spend one minute before I conclude. Uh, basically, I think this is really important for adoption uh, of processing in memory. What is the minimal thing that you can do? Uh, and in this case, for example, we added instructions uh, that can be offloaded to the memory engine uh, into the ISA. And th those are the minimal thing that you could do. The instructions essentially operate. Uh, uh, you add instructions. Uh, let me give you an example, actually, very quickly. I'll skip this one. But for example, this one is adding something to a memory location. You need to bring a cache block, and you need to write back the cache block. You need to move 128 bytes to execute this. If you actually change that to a pim add instruction, that the system can execute either here or here, that's the instruction that we add, for example. Then you have, essentially if you are sending only one 8-byte value to the memory, and the memory does the addition. So you basically move 8 bytes as opposed to moving 128 bytes. That immediately saves you uh, one, uh, 15 out of 16th of your bytes, right? And we show that you can actually gain a lot of performance, and there are different types of instructions that you can add. And this is very practical, actually. Of course, the benefits are not very high. I'll give you the benefits very quickly. Uh, essentially, the performance improvement is about 47% if you actually pick the instructions. And the uh, energy reduction is still significant, 25%, of course, in large data sets. Large data sets are the ones that benefit a lot. If you have small data sets, it's better to execute those in the processor. OK, I moved through this relatively quickly, so now let's conclude. Any questions in the meantime? Or have I hammered you a lot? <laughs> OK. Uh, I think, I think before we conclude, let me uh, talk about this very quickly. I think it's really important to be cognizant of adoption issues, because this is really a paradigm shift in the end. And there are many, many adoption issues, like applications about kind of workloads benefit from this. That's why we've been doing a lot of these workload studies. Actually, we have a workload suite of 350 workloads, real workloads right now, that we examine. And we're going to release a benchmark suite uh, related to that. Ease of programming is an issue. System support, coherence, and virtual memory. Also, system support in terms of compilers and runtime systems, adaptive scheduling, data mapping, sharing control. These all need to be figured out somehow. Infrastructures to assess benefits and feasibility, they're all important. Essentially, to enable this, we need to revisit the entire stack. But I think we can get there step by step. Essentially, PIM-enabled instructions, looking at the minimal approaches to enable this is really important. But we should also look at the maximal approaches. And I think if you're interested, this is the paper that we've written recently that covers a lot of the uh, work in processing in memory, including a historical perspective on, uh, on processing in memory. Now let me conclude over here, and then maybe we can take a bunch of questions.
OK, that's my concluding remarks. And that's the most fun part of the talk, I think. <laughs> so since you're, not, since you're still here, I, think, I guess you're not bored. So hopefully this will not bore you. So one architect uh, uh, had this quote, basically. He said that architecture should be based upon principle, not upon precedent. Precedent me, uh, is what comes before. Principle is principle, of course. Your principle, then you design based on some principles. Does anybody know who said this? He's a real architect, like designs real buildings or designed real buildings. And he looked like this. He had his principled ways of, ways of designing things. He was Frank Lloyd Wright, very famous American architect. And he didn't design this because this is not as principled as what he would like. This is like, not bad. It works. I don't mind living there. But I would probably prefer living here. This is falling, yeah, falling water. Essentially, it's very close to CMU. And I used to have this as an assignment to my students, go and visit there and be creative and learn the principles. And this is actually based on some beautiful principles. It's organic architecture. This, it's on top of a waterfall. And you can see that it's really imitating how the waterfall is designed or put there. Uh, and the principle is organic architecture. I'm not going to go into this design. Of course, this is cheap, old technology. This is expensive, new technology. You need to pay some cost to get here. And in fact, when Kaufman's ordered this, they had some budget. Frank Lloyd Wright exceeded that budget probably five, six times. And after some time, they said, stop, we're done. <laughs> so they didn't want to pay more. So to get to new technology, you need to pay some cost. It's not going to be free. This is, you may empathize with this more. There are train stations all over Europe. Uh, Switzerland is one example. This is old technology. It works. It's not bad. But it's nothing like this. It's a special train station. Does anybody know where this is? If you visited Zurich, it's in a bahn of Stadelhofen in Zurich. And you can see that it's based on some principle. This picture doesn't do justice to it, actually. Uh, this is another train station in Lisbon, in Portugal. These are the blueprints of that, based on the architect. This is another thing that's designed based on similar principles. Does anybody know who this is, uh, what this is? This is in Spain, Valencia. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> City of Arts and Sciences. It's beautiful, actually. You saw this, yeah. I was inside it also. It's, it's actually much not, uh, even more impressive once, once you go inside. Uh, it's based on some principles, similar principles, actually. As you can see, the structures are similar also. This is another one. Does anybody know where this is? This is New York, and I would recommend visiting it. This has an interesting story. This is, according to Wikipedia, this cost New Yorkers $4 billion. And this is actually very close to the World Trade Center. Uh, and this is a train station also. Underneath, there's a huge metro hub and also a shopping mall inside. And this was designed. There was a lot of controversy. Uh, people didn't want to pay for it. And actually, uh, it's not the full design again. It cost a lot, but the architect wasn't able to do everything he wanted <laughs> because he, he needed more money for that. <laughs> and this is the architect, Santiago Calatrava. He's an ETH alumnus, actually. He did his PhD in civil engineering. And all of the other buildings that I showed you after Falling Water was designed by him. And it's based on some principle. But they moved to this new technology. OK, they moved to this new technology by paying a lot of cost. Now people go inside there, and they're very happy, looking, oh, this looks very nice, right? They're taking a lot of pictures. So the move to new technology has been accomplished. <laughs> Essentially, people forgot about the cost. I think I, I view a paradigm shift this way. Once you pay the cost, you move to the new technology, and new technology takes you somewhere that you didn't imagine before. I think parsing in memory is very similar to that. And it's based on, clearly parsing in memory is based on some principle, just like these architectures are based on. And that's the principle of minimizing the data moment, right? So I, will, I don't claim to know all of the principles for uh, overarching principles for computing. And I believe there are multiple principles. And I believe processor-centric paradigm has its place in those principles. But it's not the only principle, in my opinion, to design computing systems. There are many, many more principles that are out there that we should really explore and enable in existing systems. And minimizing data movement through computation and memory is one of them. But there could be other, others, of course. So essentially, it's time, I think, to design principled system architectures to solve the memory problem. And we have a huge memory problem. We want to design complete systems to be truly balanced, high performance, energy efficient, meaning that they should be data centric or memory centric. And we want to enable computation capability inside and close to memory. I believe this can lead to orders of magnitude improvements. I've given you some examples, but I think the benefits will really come from uh, very similar to row hammer work, for example. People didn't exploit bit flips before row hammer happened, but now everybody's exploiting bit flips. Once 
you have computation capability inside memory, people are going to exploit that and they're going to show even more benefits in my opinion uh, than what we have shown. Uh, you can enable new applications and computing platforms. I think bioinformatics is an example of it. I believe there, people are very creative. They will come up with even more applications. And maybe this will enable a better understanding of the nature because I don't believe the uh, computing as we design it. Uh, so I have some background in psychology. And psychology in the 20th century was fascinated with uh, computing. Why? Because they thought that they could use computers as a model for humans. And that effort failed because clearly computers don't behave like humans. But maybe if we actually have something more data-centric that will uh, uh, look more like humans. Actually, neuromorphic computing is based on that, right? And maybe there are some other things that we don't know of over here. So I think regardless of the challenges, there are a lot of opportunities, but we have to think across the stack and we can get there step by step. So if you're in doubt, I think we've enabled other technologies. So if I have to pick one thing that has enabled this technology, what do you think that is? It's a memory technology and it's called flash memory. So this wouldn't be in my hand right now or at least not in the same capability if I didn't have flash memory inside here. But if you go back 20, 30 years, well, not that, uh, for at least two decades, flash memory was a very doubtful technology. The original inventor of flash memory technology had a lot of hard time in Toshiba, for example. I know of people who were writing proposals to the US National Science Foundation saying, I want to, uh, I want to study garbage collection flash memories. It's going to be very important in the future. And they would get a reject stamp. Nobody cares about this technology. I think that's a very limited view. Today, garbage collection is employed in all flash memory disks, and it's a critical part of flash memory. So that's why I think we need to enable technologies going forward. And this is a key example of a technology that actually disrupted the field. It, it required a lot of effort. I think processing in memory will require even more effort, frankly. We should not really fool ourselves. It's not going to happen overnight. It will require a lot of effort. But I think we need to solve the problems to enable something like the Oculus that's in New York where we could really look in an amazed manner and enjoy the experience going forward. And the experience is not just experience, I think. What's at stake is really energy efficiency and sustainability and performance all at the same time. I think we can enable all of them at the same time if we change the paradigm. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take more questions. Well, any questions, yes. Time for questions. Any questions? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, I'll repeat the question, I guess. Uh, when you do the analog computation through the triple row of activation, you destroy the data. Yes, that's absolutely true. I gave you the key idea, not the exact design. In the exact design, uh, we actually create a special section in the DRAM in a subarray where we move the data first, and then we enable triple row activation only in that area. This actually, uh, I'm sorry? It's not analog, it's still digital. Uh, the, the, the chart sharing is analog, but the sensing makes it digital. Exactly, exactly. It's not completely analog. So, so there are multiple benefits of this. One is you move the data over there in that area and you do a triple row activation. Uh, this gives you the benefit of the data stays fine over there. Uh, and also it gives you another benefit because triple row activation is not easy to enable in the entire array because you need a row decoder that's able to do that. And it's not easy to build that row decoder where you can enable triple row activation everywhere. You need to really constrain it and creating that area of designated rows, as we call them, really helps uh, that. And I think uh, it, it's not completely analog, as uh, you, uh, you realized and you mentioned. I think that's a good thing, actually, because if you're in, completely in the analog domain, you're vulnerable to noise a lot. If you once in a while convert to digital, and DRAM actually has a substrate to convert to digital. The sense amplifiers are already there to convert things to digital. I think that's much more amenable. I think a lot of the emerging memory technologies have this problem. For example, if you do analog computation, at some point you need to convert to digital. Yeah. And that is one of the major bottlenecks in uh, emerging memory technologies because that analog to digital conversion is not very easy. It's also not that cheap. It's so, also not that cheap, exactly. But I have a connecting question because yeah. how, does, um, how does it affect the fabrication? Because yeah. you, you have the major benefit of high density in DRAMs. Mm -hmm. And don't you potentially lose that by doing so, all this uh, kind of stuff? Uh, uh, yes, you lose a little bit. Uh, but according to our calculations, the, uh, the area cost of everything we add is about 1% of the DRAM chip. So it's basically 1% additional extra area 
uh, that you lose for this. I don't think that's very high. Yeah, but putting all those cells together, like, I mean, we have understood the DRAM fabrication very, um, you know, like uh, over, over so many decades. Yeah. And when you're putting so many, let's say, inverter inside that, and then you have... Yeah. So we are not putting additional inverters. The inverters already exist okay. in the sense amplifiers. The sense amplifier actually are an inverter. We're just connecting that So you that assume back. that everything to be at the, let's say, I mean, um, outside the DRAM, or... No, it's, it's happening inside the cell array, but we're really not modifying the cell array except for adding some connections. Okay. That's it. Yeah, we, yeah okay. exactly. We feedback uh, that. See. You need some, yes, it, it, you do need to change some things close yeah. to the cell array, yeah. but we're really not, not modifying the fundamental Is structure. Is there any kind of working prototype for this? No, unfortunately not. As because far as I know. Because for rams people uh, are not trying to build, you know? Yeah, rams are a bit easier. DRAMs actually, if you really want to build a prototype in DRAM, it turns out it's much harder. Yeah. Because so there that, are three that, major that, manufacturers, yeah. you can build a very uh, low density prototype. Yeah. So I, is, that, how that interesting is that going to be? Uh, is a good question. Okay. Uh, but I, uh, I know, uh, we actually work with manufacturers, and they're yeah. they're really interested in looking into this yeah. for sure. And they have done some studies that I might be happy to talk yeah. about separately yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, about this. That's a great question. I like that question. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So actually, uh, first of all, uh, there are multiple ways of answering this question. <laughs> I'll start with the first way. I don't work only on DRAM. I, we focus some of the processing in memory work on DRAM because it's one of the highest density chips. But we actually looked at phase change memory, for example, a lot, and STTMM a lot also, uh, and some other technologies. So we have a lot of other work related to that. Uh, uh, and I, I agree that emerging technologies are absolutely very, very interesting. Uh, and they, they are much more scalable. That was our argument when we uh, wrote our ISCA 2009 paper for phase change memory to replace DRAM. We actually made very similar arguments like you have, you're, you're making. DRAM will be replaced uh, with phase change memory, for example. That was one of the example technologies because phase change memory is much more scalable. Uh, now, I'm not sure if I fully agree with that. Uh, the, the, I think it's really important to examine emerging technologies, no question about that. And at some point, DRAM may potentially be replaced. I don't know if it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I don't know that. Uh, but I think it's good to look at multiple technologies. Uh, and it's also uh, interesting that some of the, tech, uh, some of the ideas that uh, are applicable to DRAM are also applicable to emerging technologies. So there's a technology-dependent and technology-independent part to these ideas. Uh, and it turns out, actually, the, the, the analog operations that we propose, for example, row clone, bitwise AND and OR, uh, other folks actually built on our work and showed that you could do these in PCM as well. So that's one of the reasons why. Uh, now, if you, if you really challenge me and say that, okay, DRAM is not going to be around, uh, I will probably push back and say, there is a lot of investment in DRAM technology, and I think DRAM is not going to go away very soon. I'm not, I'm not saying this to disagree with you, uh, but this is the realization that I have come to also uh, over the years. Uh, I, I, I'm very technology agnostic as an, as an academic, but I think it's, it's probably going to be very difficult to have a technology that has the characteristics of the year. <laughs> okay, we should probably discuss that offline. I, I'd like to lear learn more about it uh, for sure, absolutely. So if there's something that actually has similar properties, like DM uses the same production lines, yes, then it can be replaced potentially. But maybe some of these ideas are applicable to the, that technology also. Yeah, exactly. Maybe not all of them, but some of them could be applicable to that technology. And also I think the thinking style could be applicable because uh, if you look at uh, the way Ambit is designed, it's bulk bitwise. Uh, assume the substrate, you develop algorithms on top of this bulk bitwise execution. Uh, maybe you can do that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. So we can have I'm not sure. We want to get rid of refresh also. I think this, this, this wants a further discussion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, so any other question? Because the next lecture, I think, is, is going to happen. So yeah, yeah please. Right. Jürgen. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's yeah. so. That's a great question. Basically, as far as we know, according to the studies, uh, there is no correlation between the weak cells in terms of spatial location. They're random. Okay. It's because it's based on, and there's a reason for it. There's a random process variation, okay. really affecting individual cells. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I like the example showing in the beginning with different types of memories in the same system. Uh, do you imagine this will place some sort of burden on the programmer to decide now he will not have to know your application where what yeah. goes where in the memory? Will it happen? Does it have an economic impact in that outflow? So uh, I think the answer is yes. If you're conscious about your performance and energy, yes. Uh, but that's true for caches also today, right? If you really want to get the highest performance, uh, you really need to know what's happening in your caches. Uh, so I think uh, people will try to develop substrates to minimize the uh, burden on the programmer, clearly. There will be a lot of runtime mechanisms. And actually, there are a lot of proposals in literature that clearly I didn't go over to manage these memories. But if someone wants to get the highest performance, they will have to do what programmers are doing with caches right now. Yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. yeah. So, any other question or not? Okay, uh, there's one more over there. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so what I'm proposing is not abandoning what we do today. Uh, what I'm proposing is having the option to do the operation somewhere else. Essentially, I'm not saying all of, everything should be done in memory. Because I don't believe that's the case, actually. There are some cases where the processor, as we designed it today, is very efficient. Especially if you can reuse the data a lot, for example. But, but we need to figure out somehow when is, uh, yeah. Uh, how to partition applications such that you can use the uh, best processing engines for different parts. And we're actually looking at that problem right now. We have a paper coming up uh, at ISCA that looks at the coherence problem, for example. If you have PIM processing in memory engine plus a CPU, how do you maintain the data coherence, assuming that the work is partitioned between them? Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> It's not an easy problem. I mean, this problem exists also in any accelerator, right? If you have a GPU plus CPU, how do you partition your application between those two such that you get the best of both worlds? So this, but, but I think this will solve the data movement problem in the sense that uh, you're not going to be moving everything to the processor. You're going to restrain time data movement in the processor, uh, in, in the memory. And a lot of your data movement intensive parts will remain there. And an intelligent partitioner of the program will put only those parts of the program that do not move data between the processor and memory inside the processor, right? Yeah, I, I think that answer the multiplex of this question because uh, when you optimize software and, and you look at what takes the most time and then you eliminate it, make the strong element and then everything goes up. So, so it's yeah, yeah. another bottleneck. Yeah, <laughs> but it won't be the data moment bottleneck, I will argue. <laughs> I guess we have to stop here because there are a lot of uh, guys standing outside. So okay. Onur anyway will be in my office today also and tomorrow. So if you need further discussions, please stop by. So uh, you know, we welcome you. Okay. So thank you very much and okay. have a nice day. Yeah, thank you. And if you if you're interested, contact me. You can use my email omutlatgmail.com. I'll be around for today and tomorrow. Very interested, I yeah. was expected, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, that's a good idea.